It was the crowning achievement of Constacon 1787, but America's approach to representative democracy has a few unsightly warts that have since taken shape. No, I'm not going to say democracy is fundamentally flawed due to Arrow's impossibility theorem, and I'm not talking about how we can't fairly apportion representatives to the states thanks to the Belinsky Young theorem. Today, we discuss a recent theorem about what state representatives secretly do with pens and pencils behind closed doors. Gerrymandering. 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 Partisan gerrymanders. Partisan gerrymanders. Partisan gerrymandering on steroids. Race-based gerrymandering. One of the most gerrymandered maps in the country. Think about that gerrymander. Gerrymandering is a real problem. So I say it is time to say hasta la vista to gerrymandering. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Terminator. After each census, state representatives have to redraw voting districts, and sometimes they abuse their power by drawing maps to favor one group over another. These shape-contorting, anti-democratic shenanigans are known as gerrymandering. The word was coined when Massachusetts Governor Elbridge Gerry approved a district shape that resembled a salamander and the Boston Gazette decided to throw some shade. Today, the problem is rampant. The most common victims are people of color and the state's political minority. Meanwhile, the media upholds its tradition of shaming the ugliest of district shapes. All right, time for an exercise. Suppose we have a state made up of 36 square precincts. How should we split this state into four districts of equal size? You may be inclined to draw square districts, but suppose the 11 precincts in green make up a racial or political minority in the state. Then each square district ends up drowning out this minority population. And that doesn't seem right. In the spirit of representative democracy, we should try to draw a majority-minority district. Pause the video and visit waitingforzeno.com slash gerrymander to find a connected district made up of five green precincts and four orange precincts. Did you find a solution? Here's a few. Ugh, these shapes are awful. This looks like gerrymandering. Okay. Maybe we shouldn't sick the Terminator on you. Maybe some districts that look gerrymandered are actually necessary for representative democracy. Let's refine this thought with a hypothesis. Maybe voters can be distributed in such a way that many of them belong to the minority population, but every majority-minority district with enough voters has a strange shape. This is the essence of a recent impossibility theorem for gerrymandering. So why does this happen? Let's focus on a particular arrangement of voters. Take a grid of squares and put four green points and five orange points in each square. The green points represent a minority population. Now draw a majority-minority district. The boundary of this district cuts inside some of the squares, so we call them cut squares. Let's call the other squares in the district inner squares. We're going to keep track of how far ahead or behind the green vote is in each square of the district. Since each square contributes four green votes and five orange votes, we lose one vote in each inner square, but we gain as many as four votes in each cut square. This means that for a majority-minority district, at least a fifth of the squares it touches need to be cut squares. While this requirement might seem harmless, when enough squares are in play, this is what forces the district to look strange. But before we indulge in the mathematics of strange shapes, let's build our intuition with a few examples. Suppose we have a square district. Let's agree this is not a strange shape. You can't tell yet, but this particular district is huge. 
it intersects a total of 2,500 squares. But only 7% of these are cut squares, so it's not a majority-minority district. Let's consider another district with 2,500 squares. This rectangle has a slightly less regular shape, but you wouldn't call it strange. Accordingly, only 9% of the squares are cut squares. Okay, this L-shaped district would probably raise a few eyebrows. And sure, it has more cut squares, but it's still not enough to form a majority-minority district. That's more like it. A carefully drawn district with this many cut squares could be majority-minority. And yes, this C-shaped district would look very strange. At this point, you may have noticed that the number of squares roughly corresponds to the area of the district, while the number of cut squares corresponds to its perimeter. Also, the examples we've seen illustrate a key concept, namely that strange shapes waste perimeter to contain less area. This idea has a long history. In Virgil's Aeneid, Princess Dido purchased as much land as she could contain in the hide of a bull. So she cut the hide into thin strips and tied them into a long rope. Then she made a semicircle at the shoreline and founded a city. Today, she's the second most famous Dido in history. There's a mathematical principle at play in this story, and it corresponds to the intuition that a loop of rope encloses the most area when it forms a circle. To derive this principle, we relate the area of a circle to its perimeter. The right-hand side is the largest possible area for a shape of a given perimeter, and this fact is known as the isoparametric inequality. Remember, we call a shape strange if it wastes perimeter to contain less area. We can measure strangeness by taking the fraction of area to the isoparametric upper bound. The smaller the fraction, the stranger the shape. In geometry, this is known as the isoparametric quotient. But in the context of gerrymandering, it's called the Palsby popper score, and it's remarkably tiny for the most famous of strangely shaped districts. Do you remember our hypothesis? Let's make it explicit. A shape is strange when the Palsby popper score is small, and we use percentages to prescribe sizes of the minority population and the district. Now that we've converted our hypothesis into a mathematical statement, we can actually prove it, so let's do that. Let n stand for a large integer, and consider an n by n grid of unit squares. Just like before, we put four green points and five orange points in each of these unit squares. Now, take any majority-minority district that contains at least 15% of the voters we will demonstrate two things. First, the perimeter of this district is at least n over 2. Second, the area of this district is at most 20 times its perimeter. We can combine these claims to show that the Palsby popper score of our district is small. So our theorem is proved once we prove both of these claims. Let's start with claim 1. For this, we'll use a fact about something called the integer lattice, namely the points in the plane with integer coordinates. It turns out that for any m points in the integer lattice, two of these points will be at least square root m minus 1 apart. In other words, only so many points from the integer lattice can fit in a region of small diameter. To see this, take any m points from the integer lattice and view each one as the center of a unit square. Now take the smallest rectangle containing these squares. If necessary, we can rotate everything by 90 degrees so that the width is at least the height. Together, these squares have less area than the rectangle, and it follows that the width of the rectangle is at least square root m. Now take two squares that touch opposite sides of this rectangle. The horizontal distance between the centers of these squares is one shy of the rectangle's width. 
it follows that these points are at least square root m minus 1 apart, meaning our lemma is true. This lemma is the main ingredient in our proof of claim 1. To see how it's relevant, recall that we arranged voters into 3x3 three three grids across an n by n grid of unit squares. This means our voters reside in a version of the integer lattice that's been shrunk by a factor of 3. Also, since 15% of these voters reside in the district, it follows that the district contains more than n squared voters. We combine these observations with our lemma to bound the perimeter. First, given two points in the district, then we can think of the boundary of the district as a rubber band to see that the perimeter is at least twice the distance between those points. Our lemma gives a lower bound on this distance, and we get an even simpler bound since n is large. This proves claim 1. Next, we prove claim 2. Let's break this down into some simpler facts. First, if we have a grid of unit squares, then a curve of length 1 will cut through at most 4 of those squares. To see this, take any curve of length 1 and consider the smallest axis-aligned rectangle containing it. Since the curve is unit length, the width and height of this rectangle are both at most 1. That means we can fit our curve in a unit square. No matter where we position this square, it always touches at most 4 of the grid squares, and those are the only squares the curve can possibly cut through. For our next lemma, suppose we have a closed curve of length L that goes through P points in such a way that every unit segment in the curve touches at most K of the points. Then P is at most K times L. As a warm-up, let's suppose K is 1. This means adjacent points on the curve don't reside in a common unit segment, so they must have more than a unit of arc length between them. It follows that the total length of the curve is greater than the number of points, as predicted by the lemma. We're going to prove the general case using something called the probabilistic method. Draw a unit segment at random from the closed curve and count the number of points it touches. Let n denote this random number. By assumption, n never exceeds k, and on average, it's p over l. This falls from the fact that each point is touched by the random segment exactly 1 over l of the time. This application of linearity of expectation is reminiscent of the proof of Buffin's noodle. So let's call this Buffin's spaghettio. We're now ready to prove our claim. First, our district is covered by unit squares, so the area is at most the number of squares. Next, in order to be majority-minority, at least a fifth of these squares need to be cut squares. In each cut square, we select a point on the district boundary and apply Buffin SpaghettiO. Finally, by our other lemma, every unit segment of the boundary touches at most four of these points, so we're done. Overall, we proved an explicit version of our original hypothesis. And a similar argument proves a more general version of this statement with arbitrarily extreme constants. But instead of dwelling on this abstraction, let's snap back to reality. Here's a map of the largest racial minority populations in the Chicago area. Notice how Latino and Black populations interleave each other. State representatives had to account for this strange geography in order to draw majority Latino and majority Black districts so that these populations could be adequately represented in Congress. Unfortunately, these best laid plans resulted in a Palsby Popper score of 0 .04. If you're feeling playful, you might say this district is 4% pretty. But just because something looks ridiculous, doesn't mean it's actually bad. Just look at what Chicago calls pizza.